Hi all. I hope that you're settled in now. <clears throat> this session is one out of a series of three uh, topics we're going to cover over the next three weeks. Uh, today's topic we're going to cover, uh, do your employees know how to identify and avoid external threats? This is going to be delivered by myself, I'm Lee, and I'm one of our senior support engineers, <clears throat> and my colleague Khan Tomlinson, who is also a systems administrator at BCS. Hi everyone. <clears throat> Across our two roles, we are very exposed as to why educating people on security topics is the key to protecting your staff and company. We come across threats on a weekly basis, and we have both had our fair share of dealing with the fallout of some of the malicious attacks, uh, and we'll go over some of those today. Card mostly deals with our internal systems, making sure that we have the right security products and practices in place. Whilst I focus more on dealing with customer breaches as they arise and help support customers. <clears throat> there will be a chance for questions at the end of the session, so please use the Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of the live stream, to post any questions or queries you may have, and we'll cover them off at the end of the session. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at covering the following topics, uh, which should hope to give you a better understanding of the risks faced by users when using the internet. The first topic is going to cover phishing. We're going to talk about these attack vectors and distinguishing the difference between phishing, spear phishing and whaling. These are the more common attack types that you will come across as an end user. Secondly, we'll be looking at some statistics and consequences that can arise from some of these attacks. We also talk about the rising cases recently due to the ongoing world pandemic and how attackers are using fear to manipulate people. Later on in this episode, we will look at how to try and identify some of the more common threats, including some tips on how to spot attacks and small things you can do to protect yourself online. Although there are many tools and trainings available, nothing is 100% secure and safe from attackers. Security is based on layers, just like an onion. <clears throat> Let's start with going over some of the main types of phishing. The first and most common type is just called phishing, just as you would fish in a pond. It's just see what I throw out there, see what I can catch. Fishing is very broad and a normally automated process. Fishing is the fraudulent practice of sending emails, pretending to be from legitimate companies or individuals in order to trick users to reveal personal information such as passwords and credit card numbers. <clears throat> This is generally a blanket attack with no one specific target in mind. The most common piece of information that they're trying to get from you is your username and password. Not only does the username and password give access to your work account, but you may use the same credentials on other websites such as PayPal, banking, and other work or personal websites where you may have used the same credentials or details. Most email providers will have some, some form of web-based mail. Once the username and password have been revealed to the attacker, they will likely log onto your account and will search for specific keywords in your mailbox looking for confidential information that they can use. On top of the attackers, on sorry, excuse me, let me start that one again. <laughs> On top of this, the attackers now have now having access to your emails. This will also give them the ability to submit password changes on your behalf from websites that you visit. So once they've gone through your mail profile, it won't be long 
before they can work out which websites you visit and then request that that password be changed. You will then find out that you could then be locked out of other accounts. <clears throat> we have noticed two main patterns of attack which are normally determined by the information that they have uncovered from your mailbox. The first and more common type of, a, of action that would be taken is if they were to find no further information that was relevant to what they would like to use against you. Uh, they would they would use your account to mass send out further emails to trick your contacts into thinking that you've sent them something so that they can also try and harvest their details to do the same thing that is currently happening to you. The second and less common attack that we have seen is that if they do find useful information in your account, we have noticed that the attacker will create rules to hide emails from you. This will be with a view that they, they will be able to continue reading them without your knowledge and you will not know that this has happened or happening. Um, we've seen them forward on to attackers. We've seen them stop doing that and we've also seen them hide. Uh, we have lots of customers with large inboxes with lots of sub boxes. There could be one down there just to simply name something and all emails will be going into there for the attacker to read. <clears throat> just as an example, Let's say James has been compromised and he would normally send invoices to the accounts department to pay. If an attacker you know, got access to his account, he could potentially intercept these emails. He could disguise himself as James by using James's account, his signature, James's writing style and the conversation history. The attacker could use these details to adjust amounts, change bank details, and then email the accounts department as James, which could then lead to the potential loss of money from the company. <clears throat> this is just one example of many of what could happen if an attacker has something as simple as your mailbox password. Although email is something that we take for granted and it's become an everyday part of our lives, there is so much valuable information inside your mailbox that would help an attacker learn so much about just not yourself, but other people who you communicate with. Lastly on phishing, while this is the main source of phishing attempts, uh, sorry, excuse me, lastly, whilst phishing, sorry, my words are getting muddled up. <laughs> whilst the main source of phishing attempts will normally come through email, You've probably seen them come through other sources such as social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter. Maybe your friends have messaged you saying, click this picture. Just that they, it's not just email where these threats are coming from. These will even be from, like I said, people you know, and uh, their accounts are more than likely have been compromised. So if you ever see any of these, drop them a text. <clears throat> Phishing is such a broad term. Although there are many types, let's focus on spear phishing. Spear phishing is a much more targeted attack, which is normally aimed at a specific person and normally from an appearance of a trusted person. I maybe someone you know or a senior member of staff. It could even look like an email comes from within the company itself or from your IT provider. Bad actors will already likely have some information about you, such as your name, email address, and more likely your job title and more information about your role. And this is probably the reason why you're being targeted. This information can be gathered from places such as company's house. You've got your accounts on there, people's addresses, Social media sites, people post lots of stuff about themselves there. Your company website and and just the information just can come from other people that have compromised.
you'll likely be a higher risk if you work in the accounts department or a manager or a senior member of staff, a director. You could be in charge of payroll or you could pay invoices on behalf of your company. At the end of the day, the two main goals of phishing are to commit financial fraud or identity theft. The amount of damage that an attacker can cause can be severe and de detrimental to the company's health. Whaling is going to be the third and last uh, version of phishing we're going to be going over. Like spear phishing, this is also a targeted attack, but mainly towards senior member staff or groups of staff, like accounts, directors, they just want one person and then they can spear them. The end goal here is to try and gather as much information as they can to be able to impersonate a higher ranking member of staff to manipulate the company's staff pool. Once they have this information, they can then tar start targeting other members of staff, hoping that they can trick them into doing what they want or providing confidential data that would help attackers in other ways. They can also go as far as emailing external contacts to do things or promise things or say things. Um, it's not just internal that's the threat. An example of this would be um, if the managing director asked a finance officer to pay an invoice to a fraudulent bank account. This unlikely, depending on what processes are in place, that the, um, the finance officer would just pay it. We've seen it, so it does happen. I hope this has given you an overview of some of the more common types of phishing and giving you an understanding of some of the complexities involved in dealing with one of our main forms of communication, which is email. Con, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so, so yeah, now Lee's run through those uh, the types of phishing. Uh, we just want to run through some statistics to show why phishing is is such a big threat to your business nowadays. Um, the, the two graphs on the screen were taken from the government's 2019 Cybersecurity Breaches Survey. Um, you can see on the left hand side. Um, it, it shows you the types of attacks that have been experienced by organisations within the last 12 months. The answers range from fraudulent emails or being directed to fraudulent websites down to unauthorised use of computer networks or, or servers by staff. Um, as you can see, the top answer by far is fraudulent emails or being directed to fraudulent websites, demonstrating that phishing is such a huge threat to your company. Second on the list is impersonation via email or online, suggesting that spear phishing is the second biggest threat to a company. In fact, looking at the top four answers, the chance that these attacks initially originated from some form of spam is extremely high, with malware most likely to be delivered by email. The same companies were also asked what the single most disruptive security breach that they had experienced in the last 12 months for their business. Um, and again, the top two answers were, were phishing related, um, as demonstrated by the graph on the right hand side. The reason that these would have been so disruptive for the companies is that there could have been some form of data loss, uh, which would have to be declared to the ICO as a result of a GDPR breach. Uh, consequentially, there could be a loss in customer trust. And also don't forget that as a result of one of these breaches, there's likely to be some sort of financial loss as well. Um, all the while, members of staff that were breached are out of action whilst the IT department cleans up their accounts, uh, you know, locks them up, make sure their machines are clean. So following on with some further statistics, I can tell you that one in 25 branded emails is a phishing attempt. Uh, just because it has a signature doesn't mean that it's safe to click. Um, you can also see that 51% of phishing attacks contain links. These links uh, will likely be uh, they're there to harvest your user credentials or bank details um, and may even possibly contain malware to infect your machine. Um, the main entry for ransomware, for example, will come from, from email. Um, the wider use of SSL certificates uh, nowadays, which usually indicates that a website is secure and encrypted. I know if you're going to go and put your credit card details into a website, one of the first things you look for is the padlock. Um, to show you that that site is secure and you're not vulnerable to a man in the middle attack. Um, attackers are also adopting this process now. Um, so they're putting SSL certificates on your web on their website, making it look 
secure knowing that one of the first things users do is they'll look for that padlock to make sure that their data is safe um, all that actually means is that the website is encrypted and when you're sending data to the server it's encrypted um, but that doesn't mean the destination where that where those details end up is secure if it's going to end up in a malicious database great it got there it wasn't intercepted mid traffic you know mid transport but they're now stored in in some malicious database so so the padlock itself doesn't doesn't mean that it's safe and you can see that 58 percent of phishing sites use ssl certificates the most common type of malicious attachment uh, are usually office files um, it'll most likely be a word or excel document these can, uh, they can also uh, come in the form of pdfs and images the main reason for this is to bypass basic spam filters and your firewall the end user is more likely to click on a familiar file format that they recognize as opposed to an executable file you know they're more likely to be sent a word document or an invoice or something like that from a colleague or a customer um, so they're more likely to click on it and also with the cloud becoming more prominent in people's daily lives um, everything's going to the cloud uh, the attackers are, are are targeting those platforms now. So software as a service um, and webmail. Uh, you can see there in in Q4 2018, it increased by 48%, and it would have increased even more since then. Yeah, with everything going into the cloud, it's just it's it's just a bigger just a bigger fish, just bigger pond. That's it. Data data that once upon a time would have been you know offline it would have been on your network but behind a firewall inaccessible outside of your network the very nature of cloud means that it can be accessed from anywhere which brings its own risks so you've got to you know make sure and we'll be talking about it next week but two-factor authentication that sort of stuff can can help protect against that um but no thanks for that lee cool um so as you see on this on this slide, this one's uh, related to COVID-19. So with the current situation in the world, everyone's a target. Um, the bad actors have increased their activity to try and capitalise on people's fear and people uh, not being in their working environments and working from home. Um, <clears throat> for example, Google reported that their Gmail service was used to send out 18 million emails per day that were disguised as some form of COVID-19 information um, designed to fish targets. On top of that, they also announced that they had seen over 240 million COVID related spam emails a day. Um, they may not have been phishing related, but these could have contained a malicious payload such as ransomware um, or purely designed just to spread misinformation. You hear fake news a lot <laughs> in the media at the moment, um, but, but it's just to spread the misinformation and fear, which can also cause confusion for the end user. So when they're trying to decipher what's real and what not, what they should click on, what they shouldn't, it just muddies it. Um, and also with more people working from home, communication software such as Zoom and Teams are more being widely used from ever to share all sorts of confidential information. I'm sure you may have heard of the Zoom breaches recently in the news. Um, but the National Cyber Security Centre have announced that they've noticed an increase in attacks against these platforms. Uh, it shows how rapidly the attackers are adapting their approach basically to the current situation and looking to exploit it. Um, they were they were pretty quick quick on that. You know, we we saw examples when the government was talking about locking down, we saw examples ourselves really quickly of these emails that were coming in. We think people don't, people aren't used to Teams. So if they get a Teams email from with an attachment saying this is the Teams meeting, it's That's just it. new to them, isn't it? So they, they might they might just they, click they it. don't know what that should look like. Yep. You know, and and they click on it, it comes up a page or into your details, and you know, so you know. They've, they've been hacked as a result. So, or they've clicked on a link and it's actually, you know, encrypted their their laptop and all the link network drives. And, you know, you've got restore servers, so you really have to be careful. Um, so on the next couple of slides, I just want to show you some examples of COVID specific emails that are in circulation at the moment. Um, the image on the left demonstrates a phishing email that's designed to look like it's from the government. The email plays on people's current money concerns and uncertainty, offering them a tax refund. We know the government at the moment are um, offering schemes like self if you're self-employed, you've got the furlough scheme. So there is a lot of um, money being given from the government um, and, and they know that. So they've dressed the email up to look like it's from the government, offering you a tax refund. To be fair, I don't think they're giving tax refunds, but if you didn't know any better, you might be tempted after seeing the news, knowing that governments are you know helping people stay afloat 
there's a chance someone might click on that especially and it's not like it's not like it's he have ten thousand pounds either is it it's have 128 it's a, it's a reasonable amount yeah <laughs> that's it um, and the likelihood is uh, the, the user will click the link and be re rep uh, presented with a replica government site asking them to enter their bank details so they can you know pay the refund in actual fact you know five minutes later their bank account's been emptied um so if you ever receive an email like this, I would suggest calling HMRC. If you think you may be entitled to something like this, call HMRC and find out whether or not you were entitled to something like this, rather than clicking on a link from an email. Definitely don't do that. And on the right hand side, we've got a fake email that appears to be sent from the World Health Organization. You can see the attacker has even gone to the length of purchasing the domain that includes WHO in it. Um, the email plays on people's fears for their health, offering an attachment that contains information that will potentially save their, their life. Um, this attachment likely contains some sort of malicious payload such as ransomware, linked to data loss and money exploitation through the form of ransom payments. So, so definitely don't be clicking on attachments um, that are uh, claiming to save your life. That, that's, that's not going to happen. And then on this slide, we've got another two examples. So on the left hand side, uh, it demonstrates an email that again is playing on people's fear using phrases such as free cases uh, being detected in your area. I um, mean, yeah, it makes it local. It makes it, you know, it, it hits you. It makes it feel real. The email then offers you a chance to see local high risk places via the link below. However, uh, although appearing to be very harmless initially in a simple email, the link doesn't point to where it's supposed to. When hovering over the email, you can see it doesn't go to the .gov website that's listed um as it, it goes to a random.com website so when you hyperlink you don't always have to have the entire url written out you can for example you can say click here and when you click there it will take you off to a link they've just used the same thing they've just instead of here they've put a false url so it looks like it's going to go off to a government website in actual fact it's taking you off to healing-ue223.com which which doesn't sound too too official and then on the right hand side, uh, we have an email that's asking people to donate towards the fight against COVID-19. The email starts off offering you some real information by linking to an actual government website, but finishes by asking you to donate funds to the fight via Bitcoin uh, because the banks don't work. Um, the banks do work and the government wouldn't ask for funds via Bitcoin. Uh, I, I, the poor language in this email is also a, a hint that it may not be legitimate. So this slide is basically just uh, how to identify a phishing email. Um, when we looked at this screenshot, we was a bit, um, the, the first one where it says fake email address, that isn't obviously fake. I wouldn't say that's obviously fake. I know when, when I was looking over it with Lee, we were a bit, we are two minds as to whether or not to use the screenshot for that reason. But actually I think it demonstrates that there's no one single point that will flag an email as suspicious it, sometimes it's a combination of stuff so it said lots and lots of things together yeah so you've got there that is a fake email address but you wouldn't necessarily know that from the off um it contains an attachment uh, again it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad although i wouldn't if you're not expecting it i wouldn't open it um what microsoft would do is they would probably address it to you they would put deal in the company name or the contact name so they store this information when you sign up you put in your first name your second name you know your address they've got all this information in you and they will generally offer up some information to try and prove some legitimacy so if it just says dear customer that's that's a good indication that it's probably not real um they then ask you to sign into the free six five admin center and to pay your invoice which is due now so that creates a sense of urgency and i'm not sure if you can see we uh, it isn't circled but you can see just below the address at the top it, it says your Office 365 account is about to be deleted. Um, so the combination of the two there, a user's likely to impulse click that panicking. Uh, oh no, we're going to lose all our emails and data. Um, and um, we'll show you on the next slide actually what it goes through, what it goes through to. But you see there's poor grammar. So uh, Watts has an apostrophe in it. It, it. It's not great. And also the link, when you hover over that link to set message center preferences, you can see it doesn't go off to a Microsoft URL. It goes off to some random IP address that isn't even secure. So it's HTTP, it's not even HTTPS. Um, so I definitely wouldn't click that. Um, but the combination of this stuff would, would tell me that was a that was a bad email. And then this is an example of the generic landing page uh, that, that that sort of link, we actually screenshot this from a real spam email we saw. Um, 
we've obviously we've changed the email address here but um that is a real spam email and it looks identical to the real web microsoft website so if you're clicking a link and you're taken to this page you know you've already believed the initial email is from microsoft you're taking to this page you're probably not going to think too much of it um i would say though look at the url at the top firebasestorage.googleapis.com um i mean it's got google in it for a start um but it's definitely not microsoft or office 365 so definitely definitely don't be entering your credentials into a website like this um if you're not sure that what i what i would always do and, I, and i've done it when i get into my personal email to work email saying you know i need to change my password or whatever i'll log into that to that platform separately so i'll go and google search it or i'll go straight to the bookmark or url that i happen to know it is i'll log in because quite often if you've got an outstanding alert on an account or something that is action in, it will advise you when you log in um so i I try and avoid going through links where I can. Um, and when you enter your password into this, it, be, it basically it comes up with a page saying your password was incorrect. And then it will quite often, we've seen it, it will end time out and it will load the real 365 page. At that point you log in again, you log in successfully, you don't think anything of it. You think you've typed it in wrong the first time. The, the hackers now got your password. They've redirected you through to the real website. Um, and the user doesn't know anything of it until you know spam starts getting sent from their account or they start losing data or whatever symptoms they might experience so definitely be careful when when entering your page your details into a, a a page like this look at look at the url see see where it is and also as soon as you press sign in that will go into the database of username and passwords yeah and that's, 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 it is instantly it's not even a human that's doing it it's it's, it's, it's a machine unfortunately and they're pretty quick so if you have that moment and you do this and you think oh <laughs> raise up your it department um get your password changed instantly um that's the best thing you can do and and the, um, we'll cover that off later anyway um so on this page uh we phishing doesn't just come for email it can be through social media as well as lee mentioned earlier um, it's increasingly common for people to contact companies v such as their bank via social media nowadays um, with queries rather than calling them companies are, are trying to move with the modern age most of them have an online presence now and it's obviously it's 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 more convenient in a lot of cases to contact them through uh, social media like this a lot of people they got a complaint will do it to shame the company into responding so a lot of people find that more efficient the problem with this is the the queries are public um so the, the attackers can see that they can see that information on you and they can they can use that to exploit it so as the screenshot demonstrates the legitimate natwest twitter feed on the left hand side um and then you've got the on the right hand side you've got the malicious one which is used for phishing so you can see there that they've responded to a request so they've they would have seen this user ellen um message in that west they can reply to that with the same logo they've made it look the same they've named it very similar and they've asked her to go to a link and click that to enable fraud protection she obviously had a query about fraud and she was worried about it so she's likely receiving this response to click it you know she started the query after all you know it must be the right person she's going to click the link she's going to put her bank details in she's giving them away um so definitely be careful with that it's not just email social media nowadays is a is a big one uh you can also you can tell if you're not sure you can click on it you can see that it's got one follower whereas the legitimate one has eighty three thousand. um and also the little blue tick helps to show that it's a verified account so twitter have taken the steps or or natwest have taken the steps to meet twitter's verification process to, to prove that they are who they say they are um, so just just be mindful when, when giving away details or clicking links that you are dealing with the correct account. I'm going to hand this over to uh, Lee now just to to run through some steps if you if you're ever in doubt. Yeah, thanks, Con. Now that we've gone through and explained um, what some of the attack vectors can be and how to identify some of the malicious content. Let's go through some of the ways that you can help protect yourself. I'm going to start off with something that I was told many years ago, and this has stuck with me throughout all the years. I won't tell you how many. And that is to never trust any email, links or files, 
even if it's from someone you know. And it's a strong sentence, but it's paid dividends. You should always be cautious and question the validity of what's in front of you before making a decision to go to that link, click something, open an attachment. Just just that thought, it's, it's that's stuck with me for many years and it's always helped. And I do try and tell a lot of people that as I sort of try and educate and train people. <clears throat> if you do receive an email from Microsoft, HMRC, from your bank, and they're asking you to log in and action something, I think Carl mentioned it earlier, go to the website yourself, go to Google. In fact, over the last two to three years, I think Google have made a, a big sort of say on that they, they, they will actually filter out that if natwest.com is legitimate, that they will actually put that close to the top rather than a, a web address that says natwestimabank.com and therefore they will they will they will push that much further down i know they've gone to some big strides to make sure that if you search for natwest or hmrc that 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 search result will be at the very top or close to it um, you can go to the website yourself most people know if you want to go to tesco just type tesco.com natwest.co.uk.com um, you could just go there yourself and you'll get to the page You've probably got these sites bookmarked. Just go to them. If some, if an email comes in asking you, please go here. No, circumvent that. Go there yourself. Once logged in, as Khan said, normally you'll get an ask, uh, a change of notification. Maybe you've been asked to change your password. I know if you log into the Office 365 portal and your password is due to expire, it will let you know. <clears throat> Another fail safe to follow is just to ask yourself if you know the sender, uh, were you expecting an email from them? For example, if you were on the phone with the bank and they sent you an email asking you to complete something, the email is much more likely to be genuine and legitimate, especially if it comes through very quickly afterwards. On the other hand, if you do know the sender and something is not quite right and it's not normally how you deal with that person or company, it's always best to phone the person directly and clarify the situation. Did you really want me to change your bank details and send your next month's wages to that bank? Or I'll pay the invoices to this bank this month. That seems a bit strange. You should probably just clarify it. Do not reply back to the email because the chance you'll get a response saying, yes, it's all OK, is probably going to be quite high. You can always contact your IT department or provider and ask for a second opinion. They they will have a lot more experience with this and they'll be able to advise accordingly. We may see new trends come into play over a, you know, a week time and we might see new things come out. And if you're not sure, just drop them an email, drop them a, drop them a phone line, just ask them. And it's always just best to ask someone, even if it's just a colleague. I know that we've, we've, we've had customers they'll sort of you'll go through the email and you'll say oh you maybe could have spotted this out and then a colleague next to them would probably agree and they may have avoided a potential compromise if they just asked someone if they wasn't sure definitely i think to, to summarize all of that basically if in doubt don't click it yeah i think <laughs> that's that's very safe just don't click it go there <laughs> go to so, go to the place Unfortunately, things happen. And if you do fear that you've clicked on a malicious link or entered any details, such as your bank details, your username and password, please contact your IT department or provider straight away. Don't think, just don't think about it, just do it. And please be honest with the person that's trying to help you because they're, they're trying to help you and they want to know what you've done, in what order, more than likely, uh, and what exactly were the steps you took to get where you were. Um, we, we unfortunately people aren't always honest and we find out and it just adds time and effort into someone if they just said no I click this I typed I pass okay I can deal with that that's a lot quicker we know exactly what to do we know exactly which steps to take to recover the account um, if you feed sent some money sent some money to an incorrect party 
you must notify management immediately and notify the bank and your IT department because there's possibly a reason why you sent them the money. It's um, unfortunately we've seen this as well. Um, it's not great, um, but it does happen, especially if just phishing is such a big part of compromised accounts. <clears throat> if you fear that you've opened a malicious attachment, your PC may start to open programs automatically or just start doing random things or start being really slow. We've seen all sorts, to be fair. There is no one, I've clicked this malicious attachment and it just started doing something. There's no one, I can't tell you exactly everything is going to happen. Um, but sometimes you click something and it, it starts doing something or it didn't do what you thought, i.e. you may have opened up the attachment and it says, gotcha, or something like that. And then you realize what's, what's happened. Save your work turn off your machine that just hard power it for three seconds there's a chance that you'll be spreading ransomware across your network um, and we and we've also they're, they're, they're quite clever and we've also seen uh, where they've disguised themselves and excel they've, they've sort of copied something on your safe zone so are you where all your files are stored we, we've seen excel documents be replaced with the same Excel document with malicious code inside. So when you go the next morning, when you think everything's cleaned up, you go to click it again, it just starts the whole process again. As we just got to be clearing up ransomware mess is very messy and very time consuming. And it's best to just turn your machine off, immediately tell management and immediately tell other members of staff as well to be wary because if you've been compromised, we've seen we've seen viruses and ransomware send out your user credentials that are possibly clashed on your machine that gets sent out. And so everyone involved needs to be aware this, this would be a, a ransomware as a company thing. It's a big thing and, and we need to get onto it ASAP. And that starts with your computer being off and then immediately tell people don't hide it. Don't worry about it. It's happened just tell the right people and then the process of repairing and restoring can begin. Decision maker will need to be notified in this actual attempt as ransomware or even just phishing or people reading your emails as technically as a breach of GDPR and the ICO will need to be told even if the chance of the data breach being used in a big way is zero that they ask you many questions on the there's a there's a form on the website just type in ICO declare uh, breach and you will get to a page and it will ask you some questions and then it will tell you the next steps. These these are uh, you required by law to report any breach of data and people reading malicious emails, editing them, sending them on, having other people's private personal data is a breach. And uh, we yeah, the ICO need to be informed. That's a lot of people forget that part, but I always do recommend that's happened because that's what should happen. <clears throat> so to conclude, I just yeah, in today's digital driven world, it's imperative that you maintain caution and vigilance when using the internet. We are constantly under threat all the time, and there are tools that you can use to help protect against these attack types. Firstly, I think I mentioned it right at the beginning, or just in case people weren't here, I do want to stress that nothing is 100% foolproof. Security is a layered approach, and with the more layers, the less likely something is going to happen, but still things can happen, but it's about protecting yourself as best as possible. Banks, online shops, HMRC, they will never ask for your password. You might already have a security question set up. They might ask for two digits from it, or they, they might ask for another piece of information like a date of birth. This is effectively, effectively multi-factor authentication, which we'll go into next week, uh, but they will never ask you for all of it at once and they will never ask you for your password. Um, that's, that's, if people phone you up and they want your password, then just don't give it to them. There, there are other security measures in place that you're probably already aware of when you made your account 
or when you made an account online, it asks you three security questions that only you'll know the answer to. Um, a bank would only ever ask you for one of those answers, not all three. It's just it's common sense like that. I think will definitely go a long way, but you would never be asked for your password online. Secondly, education is really key to protecting users and companies against external threats. BCS do offer a cybersecurity training course, uh, which you can email BCS Learning Zone at bcs365.co.uk and someone will get back to you with any queries or questions you need answered. But um, we do tend to find that the, the end user is the weakest part of any security system, which is why they're targeted so much. And uh, yeah, things, things do happen, unfortunately. Uh, in, in, fact, in fact, BCS also do offer security products in various packages, various forms that are molded to what companies need. Uh, again, please email us so we can arrange appointments to go through and analyse some of your needs and maybe answer any concerns or maybe offer advice. And, um, and we could talk about security and maybe look to implement a plan. Just, just something that suits what you need or what you want. <clears throat> Yes, so uh, before we go into any questions, please note the email address I said earlier. It's easier, it's right there on the screens. BCS Learning Zone at bcs365.co.uk. Email us. Is there anything else you might need? Is there anything else you need further clarifying? Or you need to talk about any training services? We're, we're, we're here to help. Ask us the questions. We'll get back to you with some answers. Yeah, definitely. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, there should be at the bottom of your screen the opportunity to use that, the Q&A. So you can pop some questions in there. Uh, Lee, we do actually have a, a few questions at the moment. Um, the first one was just, uh, what does ICO stand for? I know we mentioned it quite a bit. Mm. Uh, I'd, I, 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 yeah, yeah, sure. ICO is the it's Information Commissioner's Office. It's everyone in the UK that controls any form of identifiable data stores it, uses it, manipulates it, has to be part of the ICO. That's the fee I don't believe is even that expensive, but, um, but it's something that is by law and you can get fined heavily for not being a member of the ICO. It, it monitors all the, it's just for, for sorry, I'll start that again. It's for all the GDPR compliance and um, it's, uh, it's something that is critically important and I think is overlooked sometimes and the fines if you are breached and you don't notify or they, they feel you've you've let this happen by not having proper security practices and measures in place the fines can be severe in fact they actually put them on their website of who they find and the amounts that they've been fined and for what for yeah the, the, the trick is make sure you're taking steps to limit these data breaches as long as you yes. can prove yep. that you have steps in place you're likely not to get fined or at least be fined a very small amount if you were shown you know to, to have not taken these steps and, and we're quite blase about your security that's when that's when you get hit so as long yep. as you can show you're taking steps and to remediate it um you, you know and that sort of leads on to the next question actually someone said about um they've been getting a lot of lot of spam emails recently and they've noticed it increase as we were saying with COVID-19 um, is there any way yes. we can reduce this um there are products out there um, and, and again, I, I know we're going over some next week, aren't we? For more about security measures and stuff like that, aren't we? So yeah, um, with, with MFA, but uh, you know, you can get uh, spam filters. Basically, Office 365 does have one, a basic one built in. Um, you've got advanced threat protection, so that will load up the links. Um, it will load them in a sandbox environment it will check them to see if there's any you know if they are legitimate if there's any malicious payload there um so it wraps them in like this protection um so that's you can you can definitely get products that, that do that um we've had uh, another question come in uh could we explain what malware is uh hey we can, can we explain what malware is and uh malware is a generic term it covers things more like covers viruses yeah what spyware, should be on your machine adware. as in yeah yeah it, it is it's some 
malware is a generic term and it covers a, an umbrella of things as Khan just said uh, that's probably the easiest way of ex explaining what it is malware is not something you ever want on your machine and if anyone ever sort of comes across it it needs to come off it's not like oh you've got this virus but you can have that adware it's all malware malware is just a generic term that is just it covers a lot of bad stuff <laughs> no definitely uh we've also um got another question uh, here got another one, uh, yeah. uh, what is a what is a blanket attack um so i'll, I'll, I'll take this one so so rather than pinpoint so when uh Lee spoke about spear phishing earlier and, and whaling. They're quite targeted attacks, whereas uh, you know a phishing campaign will go to everyone in the company. Go to everyone, yeah. yeah. And it's basically it's like a lucky dip. They'll 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 get a selection of credentials. They don't really care who. Um, well, oh, they get yeah, email addresses phishing. off of LinkedIn and stuff like that. They will just go in that angle yep. as well. Yeah. And, it's, uh, it's not targeted at anyone in particular. They just use the public information they've got and, and just. And just go for it, see what they get back, basically. And uh, there's companies have got confidential data that they don't want anyone else. Yeah. That's it. Uh, and we just got another question here. Uh, have we seen a Wayne attack? Uh, I, I believe we have seen a Wayne attack. Uh, Lee, you dealt with it, so. Yeah. Uh, yes. So um, we had uh, a client um, that had a few directors. Uh, someone was. Uh, they they did their research. They used LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, they even, uh, from what I recall, they were even emailing the directors at some stage before the attack. They managed to decipher, they managed to get him, they managed to trick one of the directors out of the four, I believe they were, uh, into putting their credentials into, uh, you know, one of the web pages that we showed earlier. And um, what actually happened was, was this guy was emailing staff, other members outside companies. He, he was talking to external contacts. He was talking to other directors. Just because the amount of history of the way this person talked, uh, so it started off as a, as a, as a, like I said, let's go for the big whale. Let's, let's, we just need one of these directors. There's four of them. Let's get one of them. And that because they're all known on LinkedIn, they're all directors. You know, it's a juicy target. And then once once he had got the in, he just, yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, and it's quite scary on how. Uh, to be fair, that wasn't more of an automated. That was that was a person doing that. And um, it was quite scary. And yeah, uh, definitely to be avoided. So, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Um, I, we, we put we put so much information on social media. And uh, I personally, uh, I'm not a fan of that, but there are there is some information out there about me, and the more information you have out there, or that you know, it, look, it looks good, and it's a, you know, it's good to talk to people and stuff. But that's also can be used against you. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, so we've got a uh, another question here. Uh, if you have email on your phone, how safe is the security on the phone? Um, it, it, it depends, really. It depends on how you got your phone set up, and it depends on, on what sort of how you've got your email set up. So, best practice would be, especially if you're looking at going for a cyber essentials or, or, or something like that, um, you would you would want to enforce encryption on the phone. So, at Office 365 or Exchange level, so your mail server, you can enforce criteria um, that says if you want to use emails on your phone you have to meet this set of criteria. The phone has to be up to date. You have to have an eight digit pin, for example. The phone has to have encryption. The phone can't be jailbroken or rooted. Um, so it, it really depends. It's If you use an Office 365 um, and this stuff's in, in, in place, it's it, it is secure. It's secure anyway, uh, but we, we would definitely recommend, you know, you want a pin on your phone. You know, if someone picks your phone up or biometrics, if someone picks your phone up, you don't want to be able to access your phone. The phone should be encrypted. If you've got an iPhone, I believe iPhones, unless you tell me otherwise, Lee, I believe they're encrypted by default now. And I believe more than Androids are as well. I mean, it used to be a choice. Um, yes. but I believe they're encrypted out of the box now. Um, yep. So generally speaking, unless you've got your pin code or, you know, or your, your, your biometrics, your thumbprint or your, you know, your face ID. Oh, yeah, your face ID, yeah, yeah. Yeah, unless you've got your face, you're not going to be able to see the emails. If someone plugs into that phone, it's it's a load of jumbled up data. Um, so phones aren't, aren't 
generally speaking, insecure. Like I say, you can force it at server level, um, but most phones nowadays are are, are are secure, definitely. So um, does anyone have any other questions or anyone need anything clarifying? No, I can't see any more there. Just double check. I, I, I think we're done. Uh, the, who, whoever asked about the uh, the email on the phone is that has that cleared that up? I, I don't know. If, I think you can respond to the question that was posted. If it hasn't, you know, drop or, us an email. Yeah, send us an email, and we'll be able to clear it up there. Yeah, and uh, I think this is going to be available for people to share along their, with their colleagues, isn't it, Khan? They'll be recorded. Uh, yeah. You yes, know, so they can be emailed out after. Yes, and um, yeah, please spread it around. And like I said, education is key. And uh, don't forget, yeah, no, nothing else has come through, Khan. So let's just finish okay. off. Okay. Um, yeah, so don't forget uh, next week. Sorry, Khan. I believe us. let's talk about this one. It's fine. <laughs> 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 oh, we just clarify. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, no, it's okay. It's clarify. 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 Thank you. Excellent. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, yeah. So session two next week, uh, same time, another hour. We're going to be covering off multi-factor authentication and how we can help with secure accounts. It ties in with today's uh, uh, session, basically. Um, in the event you are breached, is there steps you can take to limit the damage? Um, and multi-factor authentication is definitely the number one way of, uh, you know. Of, of limiting that damage in the event you are breached um definitely so so make sure you you tune in for that we'll, we'll i think we're going to sort of show how some of it works yeah uh, on, on screen you're going to give a demonstration on how this works and um yeah i think uh, it'd, be, it'd be interesting definitely well cool. thanks for joining us and uh, hopefully see you all next week yeah thank you very much bye